he will uh, do everything. Okay, so I think that's mine, no? No, they say you're oh. too It's okay. Item four. You are the last one, but then you will be the first, as in the band. Okay. Okay. We can start. Hi, everybody, and thanks for being here. Today we are going to expose and discuss with you some interesting cases of investigation conducted by journalists, so investigative journalism, and by civil society organization activist. Uh, all these um, investigations are focused on financial crimes, often committed on an international scenario. So not only uh, money laundering inside the country, but money laundering with criminal scheme that go abroad. Uh, we have here Maggie Murphy from uh, Transparency International, and we'll, uh, she will start giving uh, to us the coordinate for moving in this very complex uh, uh, and complicated field. Um, then Robert, Robert Palmer from Global Witness, uh, he will introduce to you their last uh, investigation called Undercover in New York about the role of overseas territories like Panama in moving uh, suspect money. Then Cecilia and um, Cecilia Hanesi and Alessia Serantula, member and co-founders of uh, the investigative reporting project Italy, will expose a very interesting case uh, in Africa, right? Uh, okay, related to Panama Papers too. Okay, and um, Lastly, Hilia, from, uh, my colleague from uh, Russia, from uh, Transparency International Russia, will explain uh, their investigation about uh, uh, a vice deputy of the Ministry of Defense uh, in Russia. So, uh, just a few brief words in order to give you the dimension of uh, this kind of crimes. In Italy, uh, the money laundering crimes uh, amount uh, to about two and two and, uh, sorry, two dot billions of euro per each year. This is uh, an estimation of the finance police, the Guardia di Finanza, in, uh, of the last year. And uh, we have uh, two big uh, open cases in Italy. Uh, the first one is uh, related to uh, uncover illicit um, money from money transfer in Florence to China, to Bank of China for about four billions of euros in uh, the period from 2007 to 2010. And the investigation involves more than 300 peoples and also executive of the branch of Bank of China in Italy. Another example, uh, and this is an investigation opened uh, in 2014 by the public prosecutor of Reggio Emilia, uh, medium-sized uh, city of about uh, 150,000 uh, citizens. Uh, the public prosecutor of the city discovered that uh, during the last, uh, the previous year, in 2013, 448 million, um, sorry, thousand euros went to Emirates through money transfer shops. The problem is that in Reggio Emilia there is not anyone who is a citizen of uh, Emirates. So the question is uh, who is uh, sending uh, this uh, huge amount of money to Emirates and with uh, what purpose? So, um, Maggie, I ask you to introduce the, the issues we are talking today. Great. And uh, if you can open the, um, the, the yeah. slide uh, called the Maggie Murphy yeah, perfect. on the screen. Thank you very much, Davide. It's great to be here. Thanks uh, for the big turnout. This panel has got even more exciting in the wake of everything that's happened this week with the Panama Papers. Um, in many respects, 
anti-corruption activists have been banging on about the problems of secrecy in the financial system for many years, and now we get this glorious present, not so glorious, obviously, um, but it allows us to kind of re-engage with people like yourselves, normal citizens out there, uh, to try to change the system. Um, what I want to do very quickly, these guys here um, are doing much cooler stuff than me. They do uh, really great investigations into particular case studies, so I'll let them do the juicy stuff. I'm going to do the boring stuff, which is a little bit of an overview, so we're all up to speed. Um, and then I'm going to have a look at what the international system is doing. Is this new to them? What are they doing? Are they doing enough? That kind of thing. Um, and then I might just throw out a couple of things about what we should do next. Um, so very, uh, you know, let's start from the beginning. Panama leaks, is this new? Not really. If you look at any of the major corruption scandals in the last few years, um, you will see that there are a few things that are in common. Um, you've got secret companies that are used to transfer money uh, from one place to another, um, allowing the, the person at the core uh, to hide their identity, hide their link to that corrupt money. Um, corruption basically depends on this type of secrecy. And the way that you can do that is either by setting up a shell company that doesn't really ask you for much information or will hide that information from someone that comes asking, or you can uh, get a nominee that will sign all the papers for you so that your name doesn't, doesn't get linked to anything further down the chain. Um, it's really good if you set it up in a place that doesn't ask many questions. It's even better if you can then link that uh, to another one in another jurisdiction, preferably one that doesn't really talk to the first jurisdiction, um, and maybe uh, add it, have that be owned by an additional company, um, so just creating a really complex layer so that anyone that's trying to follow that money trail has to knock on multiple doors to get there. And the corrupt person in these cases, uh, the person that, the, that's controlling those funds is called the beneficial owner, which is a term, it's a bit, it's not, it's not very sexy, um, but it's probably a term that you guys have started to hear a bit more uh, and is something that, that is coming up a little bit more, so keep that in the back of your mind. Beneficial ownership, secrecy, therefore, is one of the major uh, challenges of our day, I would suggest. Um, now, what's the problem with all this secrecy? Uh, this just makes it absolutely impossible to uh, find and locate and follow the source of that funds back to the core person. And the UN estimates that um, only 1% of illicit flows is actually uh, able to be identified. Um, the that's the global detection rate of illicit money. Um, what's the impact? We're looking at about $2 trillion a year that's laundered. That's uh, like the top end of some of the estimates, but the estimates are very difficult, obviously, to, uh, to come to. So there's lots of figures that they are playing about. So a bit of a recap, um, three things that, uh, that all these cases have in common and many of the Panama Papers cases have in common. One, the opportunity to be corrupt. And I say that because it's very difficult for some of us to be corrupt. So if you are um, in that hazy area between uh, the private sector and government, you're looking good, especially if you can get your hands on some contracts. Um, Petrobras, for example, is a, is a good example of there being a, a state-owned company, 18 other construction companies, um, and lots of relationships with uh, public officials. And the second thing you need is the ability to hide. So that's the shell companies, the nominees. Um, and the third thing is somebody willing to take your money. Um, and this is really important because uh, this looks at some of the people that are awfully respectable uh, we're looking at the lawyers, the accountants, the real estate agents, and the bankers that all sit in quite nice offices around the world. Um, if you look at the FIFA case, not saying that anything necessarily bad has happened or that these particular banks have been uh, guilty themselves of doing anything wrong, but there's 26 banks that were uh, mentioned in the US courts of, uh, sorry, Department of Justice indictment last year. Um, right. So just very quickly to show you what I mean about uh, a couple of those issues, this ability to hide. Um, this is it's just a screen grab from a website offering an anonymity package. This is completely legal, everyone. This is, um, I'm not saying that anything wrong has happened here. <laughs> it's just an example of the myriad of companies out there that are willing to take your cash. Um, setting up a shell company is not illegal, but it might mask activity that is illegal. Uh, so if you probably can't read it, but I'll just quote one little bit. For those jurisdictions where there are publicly accessible records, only the names of our nominees will be displayed. Those are the kinds of things that people are offering, you know, lots of secrecy. Um, 
But the second thing is uh, coming down to the people that are willing to take the cash. These rich guys that have millions and millions of stolen cash, they, they're not going to bother going onto this website themselves. They're going to have someone helping them out. Um, and there's a market for secrecy. Secrecy has now become a bit of a commodity. Um, so we have to have increasing attention on the lawyers, the accountants, uh, real estate, as I said, all those people in the middle that are willing to take those cash. On that point, there might be a bit of a, a sliding scale when it comes to those professional enablers. There are definitely cases where uh, people have been imprisoned for being actively complicit in money laundering. Then you've got a big band in the middle where they might be negligible, grossly negligible, or just they were really tired that day and didn't do the proper background checks. And then you've got people um, on the other side that I think we really need to think about helping as much as possible. And they're the lawyers, the accountants that are trying to do their job. They're trying to figure out if the cash is corrupt. They're trying to find out if it's dirty. They're trying to find out who's actually behind that shell company. But they don't have the tools to help them do that. Um, so some, some simple solutions that some of you might have heard of that, we're, that a, a number of NGOs have been pushing forward for a long time. Um, one, that every country in the world should uh, have a register uh, that includes information about that beneficial owner. So just a company register which includes an additional data point that specifically states who is actually at the source of that funds. Uh, the second thing that uh, that would relate, obviously, to, to companies that are incorporated in their jurisdiction. Now, if you really want to close the door on corruption, uh, you probably want to close the door not just on companies that are incorporated in your own territory, but also foreign companies. And so um, another thing that we think is worth doing is looking at some of the sectors that are really vulnerable to receiving stolen cash. Uh, so let's say real estate. We would argue that uh, countries should require any company, domestic or foreign incorporated, to have to disclose their beneficial ownership information if they want to purchase uh, real estate um, or property. Um, and secondly, if they're bidding for a public contract, taxpayers' money, they should also be required to have to disclose who is ultimately in control of themselves. Um, so, is this all new? As I've said, no, there's already a lot of attention. There's been these scandals in the past. In, uh, the World Bank brought out a major report in 2011 that is cited quite a lot, which says how 70% of grand corruption cases, over 200 grand corruption cases, used shell companies to hide the identity of the politicians that were, um, or public officials that were involved. OECD has done similar uh, research. G8 in, tw in 2013 said that this was an issue. It brought out some principles. That scaled up to the G20 in 2014, and they adopted these principles. They go on, this is just the blurb. Um, and the good thing about that is the, the G20, um, th those principles are definitely not as strong as we would like. They don't go as far as saying that a lot of this information should be public. But you still have that interesting dynamic where you have very diverse uh, countries in there that are all saying, yes, financial transparency is a priority. That's a quote. Um, Great, so uh, those principles were adopted at the end of 2014. Now, I'm going to guess that not many of you, I know a couple of you have, but not many of you know what those are, have seen them, bothered reading them, because they're really dry and boring. So that falls down to Transparency International to kind of have a look at these boring texts and actually think, well, these leaders have said that this is what they're going to do, let's hold them accountable. So over last year, it took a whole year to take all G20 countries, take all the 10 principles, and actually look to see what these countries were doing. And unfortunately, the result was not, too, uh, was not, was not great, to be frank. Um, we found that, well, G20 leaders are very good at making promises, but not so good at keeping them. This was the overall um, results. I've got much more detailed results, but I won't bore you with those. You can go, just for show is the name of the report, so you can find it on the Transparency International website if you're interested, come and talk to me. Uh, but basically, we found that U the UK was the only country to have a very strong framework in place, I have to point out that this does not include the overseas ter territories and the Crown Dependencies. Robert will talk to that later. <laughs> um, just the UK on a national level, but that begs a question, right? Um, and then we actually, 15 of those countries have uh, a weak framework or an average framework. And you'll see some interesting countries down there at the bottom, like Australia, the US, that you might not have expected to be there. Um, but some of, the, some of the challenges were really basic. Uh, two countries, Brazil and South Africa, don't even have a legal definition of beneficial ownership. So why are they adopting principles on them if they're not actually, if they've not even got that in place? Um, moving on, I guess one of our second major findings was that 
um, G20 governments really need to tighten up their rules relating to uh, the companies and the banks and all those middlemen. Um, there, only two countries, India and the UK, even require companies to collect uh, beneficial ownership information, they, and India doesn't, doesn't have to keep that updated and doesn't have to publish it. Um, so that means that you could be working for a company in any of the other countries, and that company itself does not even know who owns it. Um, and in the middlemen, we've got the stat here, in eight of the G20 countries, banks can try as hard as they like, you know, try, 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 even if they don't find the origin of, of the funds, they can still proceed with the transaction. Um, in seven G20 countries, that's the same with real estate as well. You can go ahead and sell um, property even if you don't know who you're selling it to. Um, this, so just really to maybe to labour the point on this, I don't want to put all the blame on those middlemen because, as I said, they don't necessarily have the tools at their disposal. Um, so if only two G20 countries are requiring companies to collect the information, what on earth are they doing? What, what can they consult? What can they, where can they go if they're trying to find out if they're being complicit or not? So that's a real, a real challenge. Um, okay, so we're all a bit angry and we're all a bit pissed off now. So um, what do we do now? <laughs> I'm going to throw out just two ideas, um, there's loads and loads more, but one of them is like David Cameron has gone out there and said that he wants to be a leader on all things anti-corruption. He's hosting a global anti-corruption summit uh, next month in London, and I think that this, with the Panama leaks, just provides an absolutely great opportunity not just to continue talking about this issue, because I've shown we've been talking about it for, for several years. Now we need proper commitments. Um, we need to start implementing their own principles, the principles that are not even as strong as we'd like, um, and they need to go further and actually take this seriously. So citizen action, citizen voice, I think, is going to be really important ahead of that summit. Um, the second thing is what the media can do. Um, and I'm going to just end with a little bit of an ode to the press or an ode to journalists. Um, those G20 principles, not as good as we'd like, uh, but they were jeopardized with about a month, month and a half to go. We suddenly heard that China wanted to block the principles uh, after they'd already been agreed. We tried diplomatic things, we tried you know, negotiating, we tried to use other ways to convince China to, to stop with its opposition. Uh, nothing worked, uh, they weren't interested. Um, so we went to the media and we just were quite strong on our messaging. We caused quite a lot of problems. The media loved the story because it was in Australia as well and Australia and China have close links. Um, but of course, uh, what did China do? <laughs> they said that they, that, no, they denied everything. I had absolutely great intel. So the journalists came back to me and were, what have you done, Maggie? You know, we've just, you know, you've told us that this is happening and they're just denying it. So I said, please, can you give me exactly what you asked them and give me exactly what they replied to you? And when I saw that together, I knew that China was obfuscating their answer. So I said, go back and ask this particular question. Um, and it's with that that China came back and said, oh, that thing, that's only at discussion level. Oh, that, you know, this had been passed. We'd had the leaked document. We knew that it was way beyond discussion level. Um, anyway, we carried on pushing really, really hard, and um, eventually China reversed their opposition, and uh, we had those beautiful, boring principles on beneficial ownership transparency. But that was, that was just an example of how like, activists and, and campaigners that are using their research and using their intel can work with the press to get something done, which was really important for me, even if it's not important for Joe Blobs on the street. So, just to finish, this is a quote from um, Simon Jenkins in The Guardian today, I think. It's beautiful. Um, I'll let you have a moment to read it. Um, but it's basically talking about how you need like, these, these people that are really courageous, and they're talking about the whistleblower in, in this case. Like, you know, it, it wasn't the police, it wasn't this, it wasn't that, it was the whistleblower. God, he did a great job. Oh, but by the way, um, even the whistleblower depends on the press. And I think I'm just going to leave that with you guys as journalists, as, um, as people that work in the media, to think about your role in exposing these kinds of uh, scandals and helping us to try and change these things uh, to make the world a better place. So, thank you. Okay, thanks, Maggie. Now, Cecilia and Alessia will expose us. Alessia first will expose their last investigation referring to the Panama Papers too, and uh, I suppose you need uh, 
just uh, give me, okay. So. Yeah, the Japanese, Japanese Japan Japanese. Times. This one? New Yoma, yeah. Japan Times, yeah. Then, so, it was about, no, it's not, J Japan Times. Japan <laughs> anyway. Times. Is that right? um, so about one year ago, I was approached by ICAJ, and I was asked to take part to this new project called uh, now called uh, Panama Papers, but the project is called Prometheus. Uh, I was asked, I'm a freelancer, but I'm one of the co-founders together with Chianesi uh, of the center um, of the ERP, which is the Investigative Reporting Project Italy. We founded it. Two, two, uh, three years ago. And uh, I was asked, together with another colleague from New York, she's uh, Italian as well, but she lives there, to follow the Japanese team of the Panama Papers, or the Prometheus team. So uh, I've studied Japanese, I've followed the Japanese issues since years, 16 years. So even if I'm Italian, I was asked to follow this specific topic uh, and uh, so uh, I started with this colleague. There were no other Japanese in the, the project. So we were just two Italians following the Japanese uh, uh, corruption cases. So it was a challenge in a challenge, a battle in a battle, since uh, we are not Japanese. And uh, even, though, even if we, do, we know, we speak the language, we know Japanese, we have to study the Japanese tax system. And uh, yeah, it's not that easy. We have to find Japanese names inside these uh, 11 million uh, files. Um, that includes uh, PDFs, emails, many documents. And some of them were not um, digitalized, so we have to read, get through all of these files, thousands of files, <coughs> with names. We, have to, we had to understand uh, so we, after three, four months, we, after we collected a bunch of names uh, came, that came out from, the, uh, from these files, uh, we started creating and analyzing and uh, making sense of these files and uh, seeing, trying to understand what trends was going on uh, in, uh, in Japan. For example, we found that there were a specific group uh, of uh, professionals that were trying to um, uh, create these fictional uh, companies uh, uh, in British Virgin Islands uh, to protect their own assets in a specific uh, period of time. And we wondered why now. So we had to analyze the Japanese tax system and we found out that in that moment there was uh, a new law launched by the, the, the Japanese uh, government uh, that uh, um, um, were uh, make more difficult for this group of professionals to um, protect their own uh, assets uh, or they make, more, they make them more uh, a target uh, in, uh, in Japan, let's say. Um, we are still the, this story is not published yet, so we cannot say which uh, the group of this, uh, uh, which kind of uh, profession they do, but uh, we are going to release a new investigation very soon. Um, the story we realized was about the SECOM, which is the, um, uh, one of the main uh, security company in Japan. And uh, it's also partner of the Olympic Games, or the Tokyo 2020. Uh, it's also, uh, it also has assets in the uh, TEPCO, the um, company which, uh, has also we manage, which that manages also the uh, Fukushima number one uh, nuclear plant. And uh, we found that the two founders of this company in Japan has created um, eight, ten fictional companies in the British Virgin Islands and uh, other uh, tax haven in uh, Seychelles as well. And uh, they created this company in order to uh, avoid the inheritance taxes for the uh, children or, yeah. Um, and they use it, uh, this tax seven, uh, uh, creating a very complex system uh, involving also charities in the UK um, and other companies. Um, so it, it, it was hard to, to do it uh, by our own, because uh, 
we are based, not in, we are not based in Japan. So we, what we could do was just investigating these files for months. And uh, since uh, two, three months ago, also two Japanese partners came into the project. They were the uh, publishers, uh, the Asahi Shimbun, which is the main uh, Japanese newspaper, and the Kyodo News, which is the main news agency in the country. And uh, thanks to the reporters, we could uh, verify all the information we find in the, uh, the Japanese, uh, in, the, in the files of the Prometheus project, now the Panama Papers. Um, so our, uh, the kind of stories we could find in Japan was um, compared to other stories like in China or uh, in Russia, not that relevant because we, could, we couldn't find, we didn't find uh, uh, politicians involved. But still, this is a mm, huge problem because um, Japan uses usually is not, uh, also the number of Japanese uh, companies uh, um, registered in um, Mossack Fonseca are not, were not that high compared to other countries. And, uh, but it's the first time with a project, uh, of an ICAJ project, that uh, such a big story, singular story related to Japan came out. So, uh, something new also for the, that shows that also a new trend in uh, the Japanese uh, uh, tax system. Maybe, yeah, the, there's something changing also in the country. Why we were chosen as uh, um, Italian journalists, or anyway, not Japanese journalists, to investigate on this? Uh, there's a reason, uh, especially related to the situation of the freedom of the press in Japan in the last years, especially in the last five years, as you maybe have heard after the Fukushima and the uh, um, earthquake, and earthquake and tsunami of 2011, the uh, f Japan uh, fall down in the freedom of the press uh, uh, index, uh, uh, international index, uh, because of the after the election of the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. So self-censorship is very high now in Japan. And also since the beginning of this year, in the last months, uh, um, three of the main investiga TV investigative reporters uh, in Japan, uh, three presenters of the national television NHK, were fired. So. Uh, there's no good signal of uh, freedom of the press in Japan. So having an external partner make them stronger, make them feel they were not alone, and then we could do the battle together. So we did. So many other stories are coming out uh, about Japan. I also, as I'm, I'm Italian, I also found some I also collaborate to the Italian part that will be released tomorrow with L'Espresso. Uh, yeah, but but it was that part was curated by our director Leo Sisti, which is the director of uh, IRP. Um, so it was one year very complicated in many ways. Also, studying how in uh, different ways people are trying to uh, yeah um, to create new ways of making money in. Uh, these uh, tax havens and um, uh, how in different different cultures are facing this uh, uh, also the the fact and the, the that this data come out. For example, in Japan, we were surprised that there were not such a scandal. I mean, there were not such a, um, such big reactions after the the, the, the publication of these uh, pieces. And so we are just monitoring and seeing how the, the government will react and if uh, it will take some uh, actions uh, uh, after the new uh, also investigation that we are going to publish. So it, it's something new for us. For me, it was also an experiment seeing what, uh, what's going on in this country. So um, uh, yeah, that was my contribution to this part. So just for Japan. Um, yeah, I'm going to continue on the same trail, explaining how our investigative reporting center contributed um, to the uh, Panama Papers. Um, for what concerns my work uh, and Giulio Rubino's work, which is my colleague in this, um, in this specific story, um, we weren't initially involved into the um, Panama Papers, into the Prometheus project. Uh, basically, we got in very late uh, because the story is 
I may say it didn't change her life because we already wrote about it like a year, um, a year ago. Uh, actually, we presented here in Perugia exactly a year ago um, an investigation called Mafia in Africa. If you just want to yeah. quickly show it. Um, it's, um, it's a large investigation that we co-produce with other centers, especially um, ANSWER, which is the African Network for Investigative Reporting based in Darwin, and then um, uh, Quattro Gatti, which is a British-based uh, center for data analysis, and uh, Corrective, uh, which is a German center for investigative reporting that uh, built the website and platform. And if you can scroll the page, uh, Mafia in Africa touched uh, 13 countries, but if you, if you can scroll a bit more, you will see that then we focused on uh, mainly South Africa, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and Kenya a bit more, sorry. Even more? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, basically, like we did the stories, and the main story we focused on is, um, the first one is uh, Africa is Cosa Nostra, is a story on um, Vito Roberto Palazzolo, um, He's been uh, living as a fugitive for over 30 years in South Africa, protected by the government of South Africa and Namibia. And not only he was Cousin Nostra, main banker and cashier, but he was also um, a very important uh, contact for the governments of these countries as well. And um, the story that we've worked on from the Panama Papers, it starts as a Namibian uh, lead. If you can uh, briefly show the Namibian uh, paper today, the other one. Ah, oh, yes, sorry. Yeah, t today they published on, um, on, on, on paper uh, this story, uh, which we contributed. And um, we basically, uh, so like the, the Namibian uh, provided some journalists to the Prometheus project and they did um, a bunch of different stories. But for this specific story, um, they figured out, uh, because they've been coordinated by ANSWER, for all the ANSWER coordinated, I think, in a brilliant way, all the uh, African um, investigative stories linked to the Pamela Papers. You can later go on their website and read about DRC, um, Uganda, lots of different stories. And for what concerned the Namibian story, in, in, like especially this story, they figured out that it was just a prosecution of the investigation we did a year before together. So um, speaking also with uh, our director, Leo Sisti, we decided that uh, we as the MIFE and Africa team could help uh, developing the story together. And it's really been like a collaborative effort. Um, if you can go on Ansir's page, we'll show you the actual story. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly tell you what was the story about that we published last year. Um, among all the um, analysis of Palazzolo's um, deals and businesses in Africa, and we're not just talking about um, Namibia, we're talking also about Angola and mainly South Africa. But we discovered that more recently he had moved to Namibia because he was starting to be afraid that he would get um, arrested at one point and betrayed by some South African uh, uh, characters. And so he moved to Namibia, he felt much safer because one of his business partners was um, uh, Zaki Nezuma. Zaki Nezuma is the son of uh, Namibia's first president. So quite an important personality in the country. And the two had gotten um, together in uh, the diamond industry in Namibia, even with a company called uh, New Diamond that um, is one of the 11 site holders of the beers. I guess you all know who the beers is. So what, what we published last year, we could really prove how so Cousin Austria main banker uh, was kind of you know, cleaned up and it was um, completely uh, like a new man into the diamond industry, a respected character. Everybody knew him in, uh, in, uh, in Namibia and uh, respected him as a, as a businessman. But reality tells us a different story. Um, and then we also published a second part to the story of the diamond industry in Namibia, which tells us that at one point, uh, Zaki Nojuma registers to off the shelves company in Namibia, by the way, with um, Palazzolo's favorite nominee in South Africa. They bought most of off the shelf companies from him, um, which obviously doesn't have any responsibility in the managing of these companies. And then these companies, as soon as they, they were um, created, the directorship of these companies were, was passed on to a man called. Uh, Peter uh, von Palazzolo Bashenko, who is uh, Palazzolo's uh, son, one of his sons. 
and um, then the ownership of the companies was transferred to um, a BVI company. And that's where we stopped last year. Now this year with the Panama Papers, we could prove that this BVI company, as we feared, is actually controlled by the Palazzolo family. Um, but there was more. We discovered that it was controlled by the Palazzolo family through the Sun, and it was controlled through a company called Deutsche Investment Corporation that was registered in Bahamas back in 1996, so when Palazzolo, who's currently jailed uh, in Italy for a mafia type association, uh, at the time he was obviously, obviously still free. He was uh, caught in 2012. So, and this company was incorporated uh, in Bahamas through Hong Kong, uh, thanks to a German banker whom we could identify uh, thanks to the Panama Papers. And we did some independent research on these bankers and we figured out that um, he's been in Hong Kong since 1977 and he's been possibly in contact with um, Palazzolo from even before because um, he's been an ex-Deutsche banker uh, man. And um, curiously enough, Palazzolo, when he was uh, 20 years old, very young, in Germany, he was working for Deutsche Bank. And that's where he learned uh, he learned like some good um, good tricks about finance, which were um, absolutely useful for him later on when he moved to Switzerland to launder the heroin money of the pizza connection, uh, the cousin Nostra smuggling heroin to the States and then uh, laundering money back in, in Switzerland. And at the moment then he was caught and then he escaped to South Africa, just to give you a brief hint. So um, we tried to get in touch, for example, with his men to know more, but we couldn't uh, get comments. Uh, we also tried to get in touch with, uh, um, with a uh, younger son of Palazzolo himself, but we couldn't uh, actually get in touch. Another important information that we got is two other things. Uh, we got the name of a young um, guy called, uh, who's basically a son, the son of, that's what we thought uh, at least, the son of uh, Riccardo Rocchi Augusta, who I guess the Italians in this room will know. He is uh, the son of um, the Augusta creator. Augusta is one of the most famous helicopter uh, making companies in the world. In 2000, it was sold to Westland, so it then turned into Augusta Westland. Why is it important for South Africa? It's because Augusta Westland in 2001 sold helicopters to the South African government. Going back to corruption, there was a large corruption scandal in the country because of bribes apparently being paid through a bunch of um, Chinese boxes style companies and um, there is no evidence but there's been gossiping around the fact that Palazzolo and Rocky Augusta played a role although Rocky Augusta is not into the Augusta company anymore. Um, however, other curious hints that we did publish last year in Mafia in Africa investigation relate to Femecanica because Augusta Westland Company is a company of Femecanica uh, which is the Italian um, uh, network of companies in, in, the, in, in the arms industry. Um, the Fim Mechanica basically used Palazzolo uh, in 2009 in Angola as a broker uh, to get in contact directly with the Dos Santos government. Um, we uncovered that showing how the Cosa Nostra in the last years completely managed to build a clean face to the point of becoming a reliable partner to governments in Africa for Italian uh, public companies and, and tenders. So the very last thing that we discovered and we wrote about is a list of um, supposedly mining companies that, was, uh, that were also incorporated with Mossack Fonseca by the by Deutsche Investment Corporation. And they're all managed by Palazzolo Sun and we think they might be active in Africa. So we might do some further work on that with answer, of course. And we must say that at one point, that was quite recent in August 2015, Masak uh, Fonseca Compliance Department uh, started, um, started suspecting that Cosa Nostra might be behind um, Ocean Diamond, which is the BVI company controlling the Namibian companies active in diamonds. Um, and the moment they emailed the company asking for explanations, the answer they got is like, obviously that they were mistaken and then they, that wasn't the case, but they also got the answer, okay, you can close the company, we're not using it, there is no, any, and the company's been dormant, there is no valuable assets. Point is, well, that company 
maybe didn't have assets, but it, it shared, it had like control over the Namibian company that owned the, the, the diamond um, uh, site holes. So reality is those assets um, surely have been moved somewhere else, we don't know where. Uh, but it, it might be that they've been moved to other companies that are still active in the BBI with Mossack Fonseca. And I think that's it. So I think just to close, I mean, our part has been very tiny in the story. And uh, I think the Namibian journalist and the answer has been absolutely crucial to this whole story. So I'm, I'm the Italian speaking, but I'm representing also them and really thank you, thank them for all the effort and especially uh, Khadija Sarife, which has been a brilliant coordinator. Wow, amazing stories. <laughs> Thanks a lot and uh, <laughs> go on with your work of investigation. <laughs> um, now we have uh, Robert from uh, Global Witness and Ilya from TI Russia that are for me strange creators between uh, invest half investigative journalists and half activists, right? So it's something, maybe a sort of a new figure that can be really interesting to, to be discovered today. So Robert, I will start with you and with your uh, work in New York. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so as, as was already said, uh, Global Witness, for those of you who don't know, we combine investigations with advocacy and campaigning. So we spend part of our time being journalists and part of our time being campaigners. Now, a lot of the focus from the Panama Papers has been on offshore, sunny islands such as the British Virgin Islands or tropical paradises such as Panama. But actually, the hidden part of this story is that it is just as easy, if not easier, to launder your money in New York or London or Paris. And actually, you need less information to set up a company in the United States than you do in the British Virgin Islands or in Panama. Now, one of the things that I'm always intrigued about as an investigator is what does it look like when that crook goes in to meet their lawyer and says, I want you to help me? What does it look like when an associate goes to talk to a banker and says, please, can you help hide our money? So at Global Witness, we decided to find out. We sent in an undercover investigator to 13 Manhattan law firms, right in the heart of the financial capital of the world. Our undercover investigator posed as an advisor to an African minister who wanted to move suspect funds into the United States to buy a house a jet, a yacht, very similar to the sort of stuff that's been exposed as part of the Panama Papers. So I'm going to show you a five minute clip now so you can get some sense of what this looks like. And I think if we could have some sound from the computer as well, that would be great. C'è anche l'audio? Sì, ok. They don't send the lawyers to jail because we run the country. Do you run the country? Still do. I love it. Still do. <laughs> I should say some lawyers run the country. <laughs> so you are, you are some of them? Two of them? Yeah, a small amount. We're still yes. members so of, a, of a privileged, privileged class in this yes. country. So how, what does it mean you run the country? Uh, it means you... We make the laws, and when we do so, we make them in a way that is advantageous to the lawyers. Two ways. We make the laws... Some people say we selectively enforce the laws. Another way to look at it is uh, the old adage, a good lawyer knows the law, and a great lawyer knows the judge. <laughs> now, in point of fact, I went to law school with half the judges who sit on the New York State Supreme and the Federal District Court in New York. This happens that way all the time. Right. You do, people you have lunch with, people you're members of the Bar Association, are they going to throw a case for you? No. But they, are they going to bend over backwards to be courteous to you? Yes, yes. they are. If his name now would appear in connection with 
buying some real estate here and other items, it would look at least uh, very, very embarrassing. Right, because his presumably his salary in uh, wherever it is would not cover the kinds of acquisitions. Well, for there. sure, that's the salary of a teacher here. And so how can we make sure that he is being able to, to buy property here and to live a nice life, mm -hmm. but his name being out? Right. So, so when you're buying in New York, you would probably want a New York LLC. Any problems with uh, setting it up? Who would own the LLC? So well, who is presumably we would set up a, 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 a little bit of a series of owners to try and, again, protect privacy as much as anything else. Yeah. So company A is owned by company B, which is owned jointly by company C and D, and your party owns uh, all of or the majority of the shares of C and D. So we we create several companies. Yes. So you'd probably be better off with a smaller bank. Because that, that would be a possibility. Because the bigger banks are much more uh, uh, serious about looking into that stuff. Their reputation. Right. Yes. And there may be other banking systems um, that are less rigorous yeah. on this than the U.S. What would it be? A num number of uh, possibilities. England has gotten recently very tough on this stuff too. Mm -hmm. um, the usual banking havens, I think, would be ones you would want to consider. We could provide you. The list of countries where the banking systems um, require less uh, detail on ownership or, or source of funds. I'd set up a Delaware corporation, no, a corporation to own the real estate. That's right. So yeah, it, it that's, could the be same, a, that's the same force. So you don't have to. But what would be better, uh, in Delaware or in New York? Well, uh, if you set it up in New York, you have an attorney general. That, that has to review everything, and you have a state that has a big corporate tax department and everything else. You set it up in Delaware, it just, that's where every corporation sets up. There's too many. The franchise tax is very small, and you don't, you don't get involved with big tax returns. It, this ain't for me. My standards are higher. Just yeah, but that's fair enough, it's good. What? Therefore, I said we have to be very frank, so... Uh, right, yeah. yeah. That's uh, that, that not interesting. Do you, have, do you know anybody who would be able I to do so? I don't think so, and I wouldn't recommend it either. Yeah, anyway, yeah. Because those persons would be insulted. I feel our, our investigator deserves a special round of applause for that performance. Um, so that was a two-year piece of work that we did in collaboration with CBS's 60 Minutes News program. Um, and the reason I wanted to show you that is both because I think it's a fascinating insight in terms of what sort of potential money laundering or corruption actually looks like. Um, obviously, it's important to emphasize, as our lawyers have asked me to, that none of the lawyers moved any money in the film. Um, but I do think we went in with a fairly random sample of lawyers over two weeks in New York where we hired an apartment and uh, our investigator spent time going out in his white linen suit every day to have those meetings. Um, and often NGOs say they're shocked, you know, me and Maggie, we're shocked quite a lot by various behavior. But the fact that we had 12 out of the 13 law firms that we visited willing to provide us suggestions for how to move the money really did shock me. Um, 
And I think the importance of this is to say, yes, the sort of corruption and money laundering and the movement of illicit funds happens in shady offshore places, but it also happens in big Western financial centers. Uh, and in fact, in my view, Mossack Fonseca from the Panama Papers, uh, they're a kind of glorified paper pusher, um, form filler, that's what they do. They're approached by lawyers and bankers and accountants who say, please set up a company for me. Um, they provide a few details. You pay a couple of hundred dollars, maybe a thousand dollars if you want you know, the full works, the, the, the stamp and the certificates. Um, but the real players who we really need to be thinking around are these onshore facilitators, such as the lawyers you potentially saw in those videos. Now, the US is the easiest place in the world to get an anonymously owned company. It is also the favored destination for corrupt officials to get secretive corporate structures to hide their identity. Uh, now, all of this seems doom and gloom and depressing, and sometimes people can just switch off because it seems as though there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, but following the screening of that on 60 Minutes in February, we have bipartisan legislation introduced in the US. But yeah, bipartisan, so that's both Republicans and Democrats, actually some of them agreeing to do something together, which is amazing. Uh, and as Maggie said, we have a big anti-corruption summit happening in London next month. And so what we're doing at Global Witness is combining our journalism, which you've just seen, with advocacy to try and change the laws to make that sort of stuff harder to happen. So thank you. Thank you, Robert. Amazing, really amazing. And now from New York to Moscow. Yeah, can I, can I take my microphone? Yes, of course. So, on the other side of the world, what happens? Hello. Uh, my name is Ilya Shimanov. I'm from Moscow, from Russia. Uh, in Moscow, they're more colder than in Perugia. Um, I'm very glad to be here and to speak about uh, the anti-corruption issues. And I'm from Transparency International Russian branch, and the half of today's speakers are from Transparency. And it's very good for me, and I think I have to continue um, the topic of uh, revealing of uh, corrupt persons. And I would like to speak about my investigation that we do last week, and we published it in uh, Russia. And it, it, it was a very huge uh, impact of it. Uh, but before it, of course, I have to speak about uh, the Panama Papers. Um, I think that couple um, couple hours ago, Vladimir Putin uh, has reacted uh, about uh, the Panama Papers. He said that he proud of the person who was involved in Panama Papers, who was the owner of the Panama Offshores and who was involved in a number of uh, uh, deals with uh, uh, strange deals, yeah, with uh, a, a lot, um, a lot of money. I think two b two billions uh, dollars, yeah. And he said that he proud of him, and uh, I think it's uh, it's a, a good sign for uh, for all, um, Russian anti-corruption government issues. Uh, and of course, uh, you may know that uh, in Russia there is a big uh, pressure for civil society. Our organization are included in the list of the foreign agents organization and two organizations that uh, uh, gave money for OCCRP and uh, the uh, ICIG organizations that do, did uh, uh, the investigation uh, according to Panama Papers. Uh, they are banned in Russia, they included in unwantable list and the person who would like to cooperate with them um, may have a criminal case. Yeah, but there are a lot of numbers uh, of murders of uh, political opponents of uh, uh, Russian government and uh, independent journalists. And uh, for example, yesterday um, there was um, one article about uh, the partners of OCCRP organization in Russia that published uh, all uh, Panama Papers, uh, uh, Novaya Gazeta, it's independent media in Russia, and uh, they say that uh, they know that uh, uh, soon they will be checked by prosecu prosecutor's office. Uh, but moreover, I think that uh, 
I have to speak about my uh, investigation, yeah. Uh, please, if it's possible, can I show uh, a slide? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think that only uh, uh, some uh, chapters of Transparency International do their own investigations, but uh, mainly these, uh, these chapters uh, uh, related to the former Soviet Union or former Soviet camp. Uh, that means that they are not very uh, transparency maybe. Uh, but I think uh, in Russia we do some investigation and the last one about the deputy head of uh, Russian government, Mr. Uh, Rogozin and his son. Uh, uh, this story uh, was about um, um, his uh, uh, luxury apartments. Uh, we know that uh, this guy and his son, they have never been involved in uh, successful uh, business. They have never uh, worked with private sector uh, and they only stay in a government circle. Uh, Mr. Rogozin was a deputy or MP in uh, state uh, parliament. Then he was a presidential special envoy. And then he worked with NATO organization, uh, of course, from the Russian side. And now he is deputy prime minister of Russian government. And uh, his uh, salary is not very big. But uh, um, uh, I think that his uh, his salary and his salary of his uh, uh, family is about uh, 500,000 euro, according to the declarations. Uh, but when we decided to check his uh, uh, his apartments, we, we understand that. Uh, uh, he had uh, he have uh, the apartments in very luxury district uh, in Moscow. It's uh, it calls uh, the, the uh, residential complex uh, Stalin's former some residence. It's uh, uh, old uh, Stalin's dacha. Yeah, it's in the in the slide you can see the house and the luxury apartments of it, and uh, the market price of uh, these uh, apartments uh, it's uh, about uh, six and point four um, billion euro, and of course uh, uh, he cannot afford these uh, apartments according to his dis declaration. Um, he have to spend. Uh, 50 years for getting this money from uh, his own uh, work now. Yeah. Um, uh, the main problem that we faced uh, uh, with this investigation that extract from the public registers was removed and uh, the owners of these uh, apartments uh, has been removed from the official register uh, and we don't know what to do with this uh, information. We check uh, uh, this info and uh, we decided to publish this story. Uh, if uh, we, we do not sure about this, um, this information. Uh, after this, uh, the next week after our investigation, uh, the anti-corruption campaigner Alexei Navalin has published uh, uh, the proof of our uh, uh, of our research or of our investigation, and he said that we were true, and we uh, and he agreed with us, and he said that this is a declaration uh, of uh, Rogozin's family, and uh, what uh, instruments we used? We used our uh, own uh, public uh, information resource declarator. We. Uh, we take all uh, public declaration of Russian public official in one place. Uh, then we used information from state register of rights to real estate and social media, websites of real estate agencies, Google Maps and other databases. And what was the result of uh, this investigation? Um, more than 100 articles in media. Uh, three times this news was in the top of Russian media. Uh, of course, Rogozin denied all information about his apartments and called us parasites, provokers, and so on. Yeah, uh, 
it's normal for us, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, after the third uh, new stop of this uh, news, uh, uh, his, the source from his inner circle said that he moved to the rented apartment from this apartment because he afraid of his safety. Yeah, uh, this was the story and uh, now we do the continuation of this story and uh, in the continuation uh, we are trying to get information about the sources of this money. And we have some info and uh, this information uh, related to the offshore companies in, or not offshore, the foreign companies from uh, United Kingdom. Uh, yeah, this is my story if you would like to uh, see more details about the story. We have the English version in our site, uh, and uh, uh, there's not a lot of publication in uh, uh, European media about the story, and you may take up. Yeah, uh, what else? I, I, I'd like to uh, thank my uh, the Russian part of Panama Papers guys. They do a very great work, and uh, but I think that they, know that, that they are not in safety now because of uh, the uh, Putin's and government reaction. It's uh, Roman Shlinov, Roman Anin, and Taksana Shmagun. They are very great and brave persons. Thank you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have to say that in Italy we have a long uh, case history of uh, politicians living in uh, very rich apartments uh, without paying anything, but uh, usually they say they that... They never know about it. They never know, yes. Usually uh, the, their answer is, ah, you never know that uh, it was for free. But uh, um, So... There's an investigation, I think, uh, clearly exposed why it's important to, to join the forces between uh, activists and journalists, and uh, why campaign like uh, transparency campaign must be corrupt, uh, must be followed and supported by many people because uh, the, the opacity, the lack of transparency of <coughs> beneficial ownership is something that uh, we pay all together. Uh, before closing, I want to know if there are some questions from... Okay. How can... Uh, thanks very much for the very interesting panel and very interesting, important presentations. Helen Derbyshire from Access Info Europe. Um, I, you've talked about the current situation, the problems, the challenges. The Panama Papers, we, it's huge, it's massive. I don't think we've got a, I don't feel I've got my head around the scale of it yet. Um, I'm curious to ask each of the panelists, what's your prognosis for the future? What's going to happen now? I see, for example, I've just seen a news flash from The Guardian that um, the banks are being called in to answer. Um, we, we've been, many of us have been pushing on this question of company registers. It's been going frustratingly slowly, all these promises, OGP, G20, G7, nothing's happening. H how do you see things going? I, I mean, I know it's difficult to make predictions for the future, but are you optimistic now? Are you more optimistic? Do you remain pretty skeptical that we're really going to be able to change the system? Thanks. Thanks, Helen. I'm uh, not optimistic because uh, as uh, a very important and famous uh, uh, ju Italian judge, Davigo, said, corruptors uh, evolve uh, uh, quicker rather than uh, who oppose to corruption. But I'm sure that uh, the other panelists uh, are optimistic on this. <laughs> and <laughs> who wants to answer? I, I can be really, really well. quick. Um, I'm optimistic right now. And in six months, I might not be optimistic. I think that uh, the leaks we've just seen, like I said, we've had lots of scandals, but this is massive, and people are talking about it that don't normally talk about it. I think there's, there's huge pressure now on someone like David Cameron that has um, said that he's a leader, uh, not only on kind of tackling tax evasion, but also on corruption, and now he's having all these people come to London. He's going to look hypocritical if he does not do something with the overseas territories. Um, but if he doesn't, and we lose this momentum, then I'm gonna become really um, sad. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think the time is ripe now. What can we get out of this? Let's, we need to do something. Maybe 
switch that one. Use that one. Yeah. What am I more on the bad news side? <laughs> no, I mean, well, I'm not optimistic from a pre professional point of view, and I'm slightly optimistic as a human being, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, although, yeah, Panama paper is a massive story, but Mossack Fonseca is just one of the dozens and dozens of uh, such offshore service provider. Just on the story we work on, we have a, ban like a long list of other BVI companies that are not incorporated with Mossack Fonseca and that we um, cannot crack. Uh, but not, on other investigation, we find like companies in Belize, Honduras, Liberia, I mean, I don't have to give you the full list, but you can just imagine, and as he was saying, I mean, the UK, for example, is already given them enough space for that. I mean, I think it's the largest tax haven that we have just uh, close to home, and then we have Switzerland, Luxembourg, Cyprus. Um, this morning we were presenting an investigation on, um, on uh, how we track the network of ships um, that traffic weapons, migrants, and uh, hashes around the Mediterranean uh, produced by Corrective. And I mean, the, the marine uh, um, industry has been offshore even before the offshore. So uh, the, I don't think things are gonna change. They're gonna maybe get slightly more clever. And that might be a problem actually because we have to get more clever now to track them. Um, but on the, so it might change for politicians that have to somehow respond to people. But I think it's not gonna change for organized crime or all this kind of, or like traffickers. But I think it does change as an impact for a humanity that might get it slightly more aware. And in that sense, I do see some steps uh, forward, like a better word in that sense. That sounds very idealistic, but yeah. But it, we're not going to see results in the short term, I think. So, I was going to say, I think we're going to yo-yo down this panel because I think, like Maggie, um, I'm cautiously optimistic. I think since the financial crisis, there's been huge amounts of anger um, because ordinary people are angry at the way the financial and political system is set up and stacked against them, and they're demanding change from their politicians. Now, the politicians' response has been slow, and it has been ad inadequate, but we have had a response, uh, and the laws that have come through are full of loopholes and are not going to cover everything, and some things will move elsewhere. But we are, I think, seeing a bit of a closing down of space for people to operate. I think one of the interesting things, so for me, as a money laundering geek, there's a page at the ICIJ with 10 charts. It's brilliant. Um, and it ha I think it is really interesting to analyze. If you want to try and get a picture of the whole thing, have a look at that page. Google ICIJ graphs. And they've got a graph, which is the number of incorporations. And it peaks, and after the financial crisis, it starts to come back down. Um, so potentially, we're seeing some of the measures that have been put in place after the financial crisis potentially starting to work. Okay, Ilya, so we have uh, two optimistic, one pessimistic, and the uh, an half one. So, the, 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 your decision is very important. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. yeah uh, no, it's, yeah, it's very hard to live in Russia and not to be optimistic, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I think I have a quick answer. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the story pushed uh, other people from offshore companies maybe, or the person who have some information about the corrupt officials uh, to reveal them or publish the information, because uh, the story has very big success uh, in the world, not only one country, not in my country. Mm, yeah, and I think it's, uh, it's a key point of this story. Um, something very quick I'd like to add is, not on the positive or negative minutes. side. Yeah, um, just since you guys do campaigning, um, something we can bring up as journalists, I think, we are in a country that is listed as one of the most corrupted in the world. But I think we also have uh, something that the rest of the world doesn't have, apart from Serbia, which is the seizing of assets. So until we, we can discover all the secrets we want, but if we don't seize their assets, they're just going to repeat over and over. So I think you should push for better legislation in that sense. I, if they can't justify where they've, why they've got a house, they might have got it through BVI companies, but seize the house. That will be a good start. Yeah, I totally agree.
Okay, so if uh, there are not no, there is a question. <laughs> Sorry, 30 seconds. We are short, sure. huh? Very, we two minutes. 30. We have two minutes. We've got to six thirty. Have to come till six thirty. No, because they need the. Yes. Okay. yes. How do you think about the current situation going to Moscow? Yeah, it's the question I would. Yeah, uh, the quick, quick answer. Yeah. Uh, um, as I said, I'm optimist. Yeah, because um, <laughs> somebody have to do this work in Russia. If nobody want to do this, I will do this work. And of course, uh, we are not in safety, but uh, we have no choice. Yeah, that's my answer. One more minute. Yes. Maggie, uh, very quick. Uh, all I can say right now off the top of my head is I agree. Um, it's really technical. This stuff isn't nice. Like I said, beneficial ownership, what on earth is that? Um, we're aware <laughs> of that, and we're trying to do things like video explainers. And But I think that the media really is important, and maybe uh, some more collaborations between um, us with the, the policy head on and then the, the people that can actually explain this to people, because sometimes we get way too down the rabbit hole. Uh, but any ideas, throw it back. Yeah, and just explaining why it matters to ordinary people. Basically, if you're rich and powerful, you can have your money offshore, not pay your taxes. We have to pay our taxes. If they're not paying their taxes, it means there's less money for schools and hospitals and education. Um, one thing I would just say, though, is I work with a lot of colleagues around the world, and the anger in the UK among the public is higher than it is in other places like the US. So we should, we should almost be lucky that we have a public that is more switched on in the UK than it is in other places, I think. Thanks to everybody. We, uh, we really need to close, okay? And uh, follow us Fine outside well. if you have uh, any other questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to keep this for memory? I will leave oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.